In the book of Esther, we have a few different main characters. Specifically, in chapters one through two, we see King Xerxes, who's the king of Persia, Mordecai, and his niece, Esther. Now, the king of Persia decides that he wants to throw a big party. So for half a year, he throws a party with an open bar. And as you can imagine, with an open bar, by the end of this party, he is drunk. On the final day of this party, he decides in his drunkenness that he wants his wife, Queen Vashti, to come and show off her beauty for everyone, whatever that means. Well, Queen Vashti, she says no. And no is not an answer that a king wants to receive. And so he decides, if you tell me no, I'm now going to dethrone you, and I'm going to find another wife. So a beauty pageant is held in the land, sort of like Miss Universe, and all the ladies in the land come to try to fight for the king's affection. For 12 months, multiple women go through this care to try to be the woman that this king wants. And one of these women is Esther. Now, Esther is a woman of Jewish descent. It doesn't matter right now in the story, but it will matter later. She decides to go through the same treatment as everyone else. And by the end of this, she wins. She wins the affection of the king, and she becomes the queen. Now, her uncle Mordecai, when she becomes queen, is outside the city gates. And while he's outside the king's gates, just waiting for her, making sure that everything's okay because she's hiding her identity, he hears two officials share how they're actually plotting to kill the king. So Mordecai hears this, he shares this to Esther, who then shares it to the king, and the king, he takes care of those two guys, and Mordecai gets the credit for saving the king's life. Yo, hey, give it up for Nicole real quick. Give it up for Nicole on all the campuses. Nicole's our uh, student pastor on the Avondale campus. Here's the deal, I'm super excited to hang out with you these next couple of weeks. We're looking at the book of Esther And here's what you need to know about Esther. Like, we are not gonna do it justice in the next four weeks. What I need you to do, hear me out. You're gonna need to read it. Like, wild concept. Uh, Esther is 10 chapters long. It's like 5,000 words. It's like 30 minutes tops. You could unpack this book in the Bible and read it. And if you wanna get the total concept of this whole book, everything happening, you're gonna wanna read it for yourself. But every week we're gonna have someone kind of unpack and do an overview of what's happening in Esther, then we're gonna pull some truths out of it. Here's what I find so fascinating about Esther, though. Esther, we we only know 10 chapters of her life, which, when you think about it, is like kind of a bummer. Like, she lived lived an entire full life, and we know 5,000 words about her, and you're like, man, that's kind of weird, but the reality is I think that is kind of true for all of us. Like, we live these long lives, but at the end of the day, what people remember are these these high moments that stand out. Let me me unpack this with you for a second. How many of you, let me just ask it this way, how many of your parents uh, love you? How many of you have been to Disney World? Just quick, like, raise your hand. Anybody been to Disney World? Uh, If you haven't, I mean, there's still time, maybe, unless you're a senior and run out of time, uh, to get to Disney World. Most magical place on earth. Spear fingers. If I were to text you, at random times throughout the day in Disneyland, the reality is most of the time, you wouldn't be having that great of a time. If I text you, like, hey, what are you doing? Oh, I'm standing in line. Hey, what are you doing today? Oh, I'm standing in line. Hey, what are you doing right now? I'm in the bathroom, that turkey leg. Got me. Just hanging out. I just paid $400 for lunch. And, And like, throughout the course of the day, like, Disney World isn't that awesome. But you get home and someone asks you, and you're like, it was the greatest day of my life. <laughs> I rode the Force Awakens ride. It was awesome. I got a lightsaber. <laughs> Full disclosure, I would love a lightsaber. Uh, I know that's a loser thing to say, but they're pretty awesome. So on. Here's the thing. Our brains do something crazy, and they like eliminate the mundane. And we remember these peaks, these moments, these things that elevate above. And that's what we remember. And the reality of Esther is Esther crushed moments. 
In the story of Esther, she did an amazing job of when opportunities show up, she made the most of them. And, and so really this whole series, we're gonna unpack how we can be students that own moments and, and not like in a self helpy way. I think we think about that like, eh, just own your moment, that'd be great. But, but I think like the gospel matters. And I'm gonna say this all the time, you're probably sick of Jake saying this, but the reality is the gospel, the gospel is, is so incredibly simple. It's so simple. I'm not good enough. I need a savior. And once Jesus shows up in my life, I'm called to do two things. I'm called to love God with all that I have. And I'm called to love others. I'm called to be a Christ-centered difference maker. See, the gospel is incredibly simple, but it's, it's really hard. It's really hard to do those things. And we just did a whole five-week series on what it's like if we try to be Jesus all the time. And like oftentimes, the reality of being a human is that people look at us and be like, man, you're a hypocrite. We let them down. And I think what's so cool and encouraging to me about this idea of moments is like, hey, I think there's a chance that I could be Jesus in a few like big important moments. And if I prepped for them, if I was ready for them and I crushed those moments, I think people would see Jesus in me more often. Because that's what we're gonna do. We're talking about moments. We're gonna look at this, the, the book of Esther. Here's what I want, to get you in the space of moments, here's what I think of, I got a clip real quick. Here's what I think of when I think of moments. Check this out. Oh man, I'm ready to play a football game like right now. I'm so fired up. Here's what I think of moments like violence. It's quick. It's intense. It's memorable. You remember the moment. When I was in high school, we used to do this football drill. If you're a coach, you remember this drill. If you're in high school right now, we don't do this drill anymore. It's illegal. It's called the Oklahoma drill. But what happened is I'm like an old lineman and I'm standing like this. O lineman, D lineman stands like this. Behind the D lineman, there's a linebacker. If you don't know what a linebacker is, linebacker is like the dumb steroid kid. That, so, sorry if you're a linebacker. But literally, it's like they don't know what they're doing, just see ball, hit ball. So that's what a linebacker does. And then on this side over here, come out. this is the running back. Running back thinks they're the most athletic, they're not, it's the receivers. So uh, the running back, the point of this drill is when we say go, when we say go, you are trying to murder the person in front of you. That's literally the whole point of the drill. And you, you fire off the ball and you attack and you go and the running back goes and the linebacker goes and there's massive collisions. And people get hurt a lot, so that's why I don't do the drill anymore. <laughs> The, the reality of the Oklahoma drill, though, and here, here's why it was a bummer. You knew every single time who was winning the Oklahoma drill. It didn't matter. The person before you started, you already knew who was gonna win. It's the bigger guy, it's the stronger guy, it's the guy who gets lower. That's all that matters. And so the reality is, if you wanna win the Oklahoma drill, it was pretty easy. You just gotta be ready. You gotta train for it, you gotta hit the gym. You gotta get strong, you gotta get faster, you gotta have better footwork. You have to see what's coming and you have to be ready for it. I think about this often with moments. I think that most of the time, moments aren't actually just out of the blue. We can circle them on the calendar. I, my, 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 one of my biggest pet peeves is when a student comes up to me and they say like, man, Jake, that test, man, it came out of nowhere. <laughs> No, it didn't. Uh, it did not come out of nowhere. There has never been a teacher in the history of the world that just sprung a test on you. It doesn't happen. You knew about the test. The reason you failed the moment is you didn't prep for the moment. You weren't ready. Jake, I wasn't ready for tryouts. I didn't know when they're gonna be. What do you mean? They're the same time every year. Be ready for the moment. Esther, I, I love Esther, and, and Nicole unpacks this a little bit, but the Esther, she's a Jew, and she's sneaking into this beauty competition. And here's what's wild about this beauty competition. It says this. I'm gonna read this just right from Esther. This is Esther 2, uh, chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 12. Before a girl's turn came to go into King Xerxes, she had to compete, complete, listen, 12 months, 12 months of beauty treatments. Can you imagine how hot I would be after 12 months? Just like straight beauty. It's literally Esther waking up every day and she's like, get ready with me as I <laughs> get ready to see King Xerxes. <laughs> it's gonna be great. It's six months, 
Six months with oil, six with perfumes and cosmetics. Here's what I think is important. Esther saw the date on the calendar. She circled the day a year from now. She knew what was gonna happen, but man, she was gonna get ready for it. She was gonna prepare for it. She saw it coming. I think, I think there's some of us that last year went to camp and we would say like, hey, camp radically changed our life. And right now we're talking about it all the time and you have a name of a person right now. Oh, you know what? I think camp could change their life. You know when it is. You got it circled on the calendar. But you're gonna keep doing like the, oh, I forgot, oh, I forgot, oh, I forgot. You're gonna get to camp and like, oh, I wish my friend was here. Yeah. You knew when it was coming. Be, be ready for the moment. Some of you are, are, are dating right now. I, let me just say this. I'm, I'm, root, I'm rooting for your relationship, like honestly. Uh, I'm rooting some of them for them to end, but I'm rooting for most of them. <laughs> like in general, I'm rooting for relationships. And I, like I want nothing more as a pastor to like watch two people like pursue Jesus in a relationship. Like I'm, I'm, I'm really honestly rooting for that. What makes me so sad as a, as a pastor, this happens all the time, is you, you know that Jesus has something he wants you to stand for in your relationship. But what happens is I get a phone call and it's like, Jake, Jake got messed up. Like no one was around. We were, it was, the Netflix was there, so I was like, we might as well chill, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> and, and I'm like, what? And here's, here's where I'm at, like honestly, here's where I'm at. Some of you just need to hear this, I think. What, you didn't think you were gonna wanna have sex? Like, like honestly, like honestly, why are you in that spot? Like circle it on the calendar. You're in a relationship. You wanna stand for something different. You wanna be a Christ-centered difference maker. And you're just like, oh, I didn't know I was gonna wanna do that. Really? Like seriously, you didn't know? You didn't know that's the only thing that your brain was gonna tell you you wanted to do? Like be ready for it, circle it on the calendar. Statistically, it says that when you go to college, the first two weeks decides how you're gonna pursue Jesus the rest of your time in college. So first two weeks of college, if you show up and you go to church, you're way more likely to keep going to church. First two weeks you show up, you skip church, way more likely to skip church. So what if you seniors circled those two weeks? I remember my first week in college and I, I mean, I had a desire to be different. I desired to be a Christ-centered difference maker. And I think for me, an easy way to do that was to, to not be like an alcohol guy. And I, here's the deal, like here's the deal with alcohol. Like the Bible talks about alcohol all the time. But it talks about not being drunk. It talks about not putting yourself in a bad state. And the reality is you live in an America where you gotta be 21. So it's against the law, so don't be doing that. And I, I showed up in college and you build this up, like, oh, how am I gonna go to a party? How am I gonna say no to alcohol? Like there's no way I can say no, everybody's gonna like, peer pressure. I remember showing up and I get there and, and they're like, Jake, Jake, dude, you wanna be your own beer? I'm like, nah, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. <sighs> Pass the test. <laughs> like 10 minutes later, someone else, Jake, 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 come on, come on, come on. No, nah, I'm good, I'm good. A few minutes later, hey, Jake, 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 nah, listen, I'm, hey, I, got, I, got, I got some, I got a solo cup, I got Mountain Dew in here, figure everybody out. <laughs> and the reality is this, after that first like 30 minutes, no one asked me again. No one asked me again. And, and the reason I was ready for that moment is because I circled it on the calendar. I knew it was coming. And I was ready. I think it would be nice if all moments you saw coming and you could circle, but the reality is there's other types of moments. You know this. <laughs> Moments that show up out of nowhere. As a football player, the worst hits that I've ever been a part of are the hits that you didn't see coming. Where you just get blindsided. There's nothing you can do. I used to love as a center, 
reaching the nose, getting up to the linebacker, shedding off, back would cut the other direction. I'd see that DB totally not seeing me, just lighting him up. <laughs> Love ruining people's day, in football only, football only. Uh, <laughs> And any coach, any coach that's worth their job in football would tell you this. If you, if you want to avoid a big collision, they'll say this, got to keep your head on a swivel. You might have heard your coach say this, got to keep your head on a swivel. And what that means is you got to look up. You got to be someone that sees the hit coming. The Bible, I love the Bible. It's one cohesive story. The whole Old Testament exists to unpack the sovereignty of God. And it exists to show us that we are not good enough without a savior. The whole Bible points to Jesus. And someone who's really good at noticing moments, shocker, is Jesus. If you thought Esther had it bad, she only had 10 chapters. There's a dude in the Bible named Zacchaeus. He had like 10 verses. And of his 10 verses, one of the verses was Zacchaeus was really short. <laughs> Just a bummer. <laughs> He probably had a big truck though, so it's fine. Uh, he, he's, he's, Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus wanted desperately. Zacchaeus wanted desperately to see Jesus. And it says in this story that Zacchaeus knew where Jesus was going and he climbed up into a sycamore tree. Shout out sycamore tree. It got, like, it got some press in this story. Uh, and he's in a sycamore tree. And I find this so fascinating. Jesus has a plan. Jesus has a purpose. He's going places intentionally. But man, this verse is good. Verse five says this, this is in Luke 19. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up. We read that again. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up. And he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. I wonder if there's a lot of us in this room or around the valley that are missing out on opportunities to be Jesus because we're just walking around with our head down. We're walking around with our AirPods in. And we're missing the chance to be Jesus. I mean, the kid that was new in your math class, like he's new at lunch too. And every day he's sitting over here and he's sitting by no one. And I'm, I'm not even saying you're being malicious, but the reality is you're just on a mission, I bet. You're on a mission to sit by your friends in your seat and get that one chair and you sit on, you don't even see this kid. This kid who's all by himself every single day. I mean, it seems like if you were a Christ-centered difference maker, you'd wanna be someone that just noticed, just looked up. I know you've been to a restaurant like this before. I went to a Fired Pie a couple days ago. And it was a mess, y'all. Like, it was a mess. Like, they were, like it was, people out of control, a bunch of high schoolers, no offense, working. Uh, and they, like, they didn't know what they were doing. It was, it was a disaster. But I've been working at fast food before. And I know that some days, those days suck. And what if I just, what if I noticed them struggling instead of just complaining about the, how fast my cookie was coming? This might blow your mind. Your parents have feelings? I don't know. If... Your mom has bad days? Your dad like struggles sometimes? Do you ever notice? Or are you just so in your world that you walk just right in, right to your room and you just miss it? And you miss a chance to slow down, look up, and just see, see it on their face, see the exhaustion, see the pain, see the hurt, and just sit in it with them for a little bit. Because you noticed it. And I have like a, <laughs> like I have, I mean, obviously y'all have dreams. I have like dumb dreams. They're not dumb, but like they're, they're not gonna excite you, I don't think. Like this, just a dream where like, stu like students made an impact because we noticed people. Made an impact because we walked around and our eyes were up and our head was up and we noticed small opportunities to be Jesus. 
man, what if we were just a little bit more like Esther? What if we prepared for those moments? What if we were a little bit more like Jesus? What if we looked up? What if we noticed them? Let me pray for us. Hey, Jesus, you're good. Man, I, cons- I consistently miss moments. Forgive me for that. Forgive me for being someone that just stumbles into a moment that I should have seen coming months out. <laughs> I just make up some dumb excuse like, oh, I didn't, man, I didn't know I was gonna be here. Yeah, I did. And forgive me for that. Help me be more intentional. Help us to be students that notice, students that look up, that find opportunities to be Jesus. Help us to be students that make the most of those opportunities. Help us to be a little bit more like Esther. We love you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. Hey, we're, we're going to take communion together, and we take communion every single week. And communion is, it's just bread and it's just juice, but it represents Jesus and it represents grace. And the reality of communion is it actually, it's the, it's the culmination of the moment that Jesus had circled on the calendar. He shows up and he circles it, you know, hey, I'm, the whole reason I'm here is to get up on a cross and die for your sins, to offer you grace. And I would just encourage you today as you take communion to be appreciative of the grace. I think we just do it, we get in the habit of doing it, we in the habit of taking communion, just like, just goes by us, it's just one next thing. Could you slow down in that for a second? Could you appreciate it? And as you're taking that communion, can you just be intentional, think about like, what's a moment that you have coming on the calendar? What's an opportunity for you to be Jesus down the road, circle that date? And then can you just pray that you have the confidence and boldness to be a student that looks up? And let's take communion together.